All right, the title of the message this morning is Pursuing the Power. Pursuing the Power, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. If you're new here, if you're visiting, if you have not been with us for a while, uh, pardon me, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do a lot of work to put you in context because we are already in context. We've been working verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the book of 1 Corinthians for like a year, y'all. I think it's actually been over a year since we started this book. And in fact, we actually worked through this last paragraph a little bit last week, but I told you we had more to talk about. And so we're coming back to this, back to this paragraph one more time to go a little bit deeper into the weeds and talk about some things. So since I'm not going to have to take too much time to put you back in context, I need to ask you a question. Actually, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today, so get prepared. It is an audience participation Sunday. And you're like, well, I thought that was every Sunday here, okay? That means it's like hyper participation today, all right? So here's my question for you, okay? And this is going to hit every person, depending on where you're at as far as our church body, this is going to hit you different, and I understand that. So here's a question. Do you feel called to this church, okay? I want you to meditate on this question. Do you feel called to this church body? Okay, I want you to think about this. See, because what most of you know that some of you do not is that as a church, we do not have a formal membership process. We have no membership role, not on paper, not on a computer. It is not to be found. We don't have all that information. We're not uh, tracking you. You know, if you sign up to serve, we have an email and a phone number and maybe an address and that kind of stuff. But we do not have a formal membership. And so what we ask people to do is if they feel led to be a part of this church body, what we would tell you is to be a part of the church body, what you do is you make a covenant in your own heart that this is your place and if this is your place, these are your people, not for the rest of your life. It's not like that. There are seasons in church involvement. But we ask you to make a covenant in your heart that this is your place and that these are your people, regardless of if you know their names, regardless of if you recognize the faces, regardless of if you know their background and education and experiences and you have common likes and dislikes. Remember, the church is a body, many members, one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free labels do not matter we are all one is this your place and are these your people and then is it possible that God leads churches in certain directions just like he does individual people you see, I believe a lot of times God may speak to me as an individual and he's working to teach me things and to grant me knowledge and to, and to convict me of sin and to work sanctification in my life. And he's going to be speaking to you in a very different manner because you're a different individual in a different context with a different life. And he's going to minister to you as you have need. And there's no doubt in my mind he's doing that in our local church body for each of us as individuals. But each church is also different. And in a very similar way, he may give different churches different paths, different emphasis, different areas of sanctification and growth and knowledge and challenges. And I think for our church, he has done that. And so the question is, is this your place? Are these your people? And are we going in the same direction? And I want you to understand as I talk about some things today, if you don't understand my heart, it could come across as almost like a challenge. You know what I'm saying? I want y'all to understand, my heart today is not to challenge everybody. It's not to get up on everybody's face and to tell people they're wrong or whatever. My purpose is clarification, because listen to me. When we are clarified and when we are united in our vision, in our purpose, in our direction, we are more powerful together. We love each other more. We trust each other more. We're more committed to the vision and to the mission and to the purpose of what God has called us to as a body. And in fact, there may be some things that we talk about today where you may say, I am not on board with that. I am not in good conscience with that. 
And if that is the case, and if you are not in good conscience, and if you are not on board with that, it can be clarifying to you to answer the question about whether or not you are called to this place, because each of us needs to be in a place where we are of clean conscience, where we are of one mind, so that we can be fruitful and the church can be fruitful at the same time. And in fact, as I clarify things today, the the answer in some of your hearts may be, no, I do not feel called to be a part of this church body. And do you know what would need to happen at that point? This is where it sounds confrontational. It means that you would need to be a part of a church body where you would be in good conscience. And as a result, and this is the part I told you is not a challenge, you would be healthier. And that church would be healthier, and our church would be healthier, and everybody would be healthier, and the capital C universal body of Christ would be healthier and would be more fruitful. And at the risk of offending us, a very church religious culture, we should still be able to see each other at Publix or Aldi and say, hey, what's up, man? How are you? We still love each other even though we don't go to church together. Is that possible? Are the people in other churches our enemies? No. (laughs) No. But we are more powerful when we are unified. I've been thinking about this concept for, man, for a long time. But 1 Corinthians 12 has brought it to a head when you talk about this idea. See, this is not coming from nowhere for those of y'all who haven't been here for a little while. Because we just finished most of 1 Corinthians 12, which is about all the different members with all of our diversity being one in the body of Christ. And that means in the universal church, but it also means in individual local churches. The context of 1 Corinthians 12 is primarily the local church. You'll see the thought again right here in verse 27. Let's start to look at the paragraph that we're going to study to get today. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now, you are Christ's body and individually members of it. This is a summary of this whole like 12 or 15 verses that we just read in the rest of 1 Corinthians 12 about the many members being one body. Verse 28, and God has appointed in the church. See, he's talking about the local church. And as a matter of fact, specifically, he's actually talking to the church at Corinth, but we can apply the same things in our local churches today because many of the principles also transition into the local church. Now, as I've been meditating on these things, thinking about these things, the role of the body and the body working together, I was reminded of some other passages, some other scripture. And I want to show you, when I say, when I say I think this is what God is doing in our body, I quite often, most of the time I find that the Holy Spirit leads me to think that way because of God's word. He leads me that way in the Bible, okay? Now, do y'all understand, those of y'all who have been around for a while, we have been in 1 Corinthians for a solid year. And we ain't even close to being done. We got months left in Corinthians, okay? We actually have a couple months left just in spiritual gifts, much less to finish the book, right? What book were we in, church, before we did 1 Corinthians? Does anybody remember? We're in Philippians. We're in Philippians. Let me remind you of a couple of verses, and this has been over the last two years. We've been in Philippians and Corinthians for almost two solid years. 1 Corinthians 1.10, it'll be up on the screen, says this, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. You see, there's a theme of unity all through the book of 1 Corinthians because what Paul knew about that local church is they were divided. They were divided with some saying, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Paul. And then the most religious people being like, oh, I'm of Jesus. Remember the Jesus Duke. They were all dividing behind these different leaders and saying that their way was the right way within the context of the local church. Then others are saying, man, we are even more eloquent than Paul. They're, they're dividing over their eloquent, eloquence of teaching and wisdom and worldly wisdom versus spiritual wisdom. And they're dividing. It's causing factions within the church. And then we learn in these passages, they're dividing over spiritual gifts. They're dividing because some think the gift of tongues is over them all and it's certain signs of things that may not actually be true. And other people are pushing back and they're saying, you've got it wrong. And they're dividing even over graces that God has given the church. This is a divided church. And there are themes of unity that run all through the book of 1 Corinthians. But it wasn't even just 1 Corinthians. 
If you want to back up even a little bit more, the beginning of Philippians, Philippians 1.27 says this, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, I want y'all to keep that last phrase in mind today when we get to the end of our study today. You see, Philippians, two years ago in this church, told us that we are to be striving together in one spirit and in one mind. Are these your people? Is this your place? Have you made that covenant in your heart that, yes, where we're going, like we're going together? And the reason I raised the question is I want to remind you of something that I've shared with you, I don't know, six, seven, eight times over the course of the last year. Perhaps we should do it every week. I want to exhort you to write this down on a note card somewhere, like put it on a bathroom mirror, put it in your car, put it somewhere where you're going to remember it, see it, memorize it, whatever. Here's the phrase, this is where I truly believe through the leadership of God's Word, He is leading us as a people and as a local church. And it is this, God has called us to be his bold witnesses, acting in love and unity, submitting to the authority of his word, walking in the power of his spirit. Church, what I'm telling you, whether you've been here for a long time, whether you're brand new, whether you're visiting, passing through, you're a tourist, you know, whatever it is, this is where I think the Lord is taking us as a church. This work is not finished yet. Do you, in good conscience, like submit yourself to that and you say, yeah, I can get down with us going there as a church body and I would like to be a part of that in my individual life as well. There's clarification in that. Now, why are we starting it this way? Well, because we're going to be talking about pursuing the power of the Holy Spirit which is a part of that statement. And where God has us in the church right now is we study the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Well, then Paul's going to go into another one of his lists. This list is going back to the gifts, although I would say I would probably call them ministries, and you can call them either one. Remember, it does not matter to me. Gifts, ministries, effects, like it says in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 12, is not really a big deal. These are all graces of God that he gives us through the Holy Spirit. I would probably refer to these as roles. Verse 28, and God has appointed, it means set, it means put in place. It's a reminder of what verse 18 says that we talked about last week, that now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. It means that God has made you specifically. There's intentionality behind your design and behind every member of the body who is called to be a part of every local church. He has seen fit to design it all for a specific purpose. And the entire body is more healthy when all of us fulfill our purpose. Some of those purposes are right here in verse 27. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Let me submit to you that it is possible, and I'm not going to be real dogmatic on this point, but you're going to see where it comes from in the scripture. I'm going to submit to you that it is possible that Paul puts a bit of a ranking on the spiritual gifts. Now the intent here obviously is not to divide, but I think what it possibly teaches us is there are certain gifts that are more important for the health of a local congregation than others. He says, first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, and then he goes into different gifts. It appears to me that he backs off the ranking at that point, and then he just goes through this list of other offices or other ministries and gifts. My intent is not to say that any of those gifts are not important, but it appears that he puts a specific emphasis upon some of the gifts. Now let's define some of these gifts, especially the ones that we have not already defined yet, and we're going to end with the gift of tongues, and we'll go back and define that one one more time. The first gift or the first ministry role that he lists is the one of the apostle. 
the one of the apostle. An apostle, by strict definition of the word that is used in the original language, is one who is sent directly from God with a message for the people. One who is sent directly from God. That's what an apostle is. Now, when you think of apostles, who do you think of, church? Who do you typically think of when you think about apostles? You think about the 12 disciples, okay? That is who we primarily think about. The disciples were made apostles, okay? We may even think about the book of Revelation, kind of like the 12 seats of the apostles, you know, the new heaven and earth, like all that kind of deal. We think about the 12. Now, one of the 12 fell, if you remember. Who was the 12th apostle who fell? What was his name? Judas. And so a lot of churches, and I would probably put myself in this category, a lot of people think, who, who did God slide into the role of the 12th apostle? They would say Paul a lot of times, okay? They would say a lot of times. Now, I understand, I heard Jeff over here. I'm not saying Jeff was wrong, even though he's our worship leader, okay? Because he said a different name. He didn't say Paul, okay? But what he's talking about is in the book of Acts, it actually says that the 11 came together and they prayed, they were seeking after God to see who would be that 12th one, and they put a guy named Matthias in there. He was another apostle according to the scripture. And so we can have great theological debate and we can hit each other with sticks and call each other bad names about who the 12th apostle will be in heaven, whether it would be Matthias or Paul. And I think that would bear zero fruit. Zero. But I would ask the question, are there other apostles besides the 12 apostles in the Scripture? What would y'all say, yes or no? There are. There are. And sometimes that makes people right there, you think, oh, this is getting fruity right now. He said there's more than 12 apostles. I'm just reading my Bible, y'all. That's all I'm doing. I'm reading my Bible. Okay? Because it identifies Matthias. Paul is identified as an apostle. I'll read you 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 says... Paul and Sylvanus, who you can also translate as Silas, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, okay? And then it goes a little bit later, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though, as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Now, you can tell by the way I talk, I did not major in literature or grammar, right? Like, you can just hear it. But I know when it starts assigning, like, plurality to these words, apostles and we. He's identifying himself, Paul, Sylvanus, or Silas, and Timothy as apostles, according to the scriptures. It's clear as day. It's black and white. By the way, that is not a complete list. We can talk about Matthias, we can talk about Paul, we can talk about Sylvanus, we can talk about Barnabas, we can talk about Timothy. There are other apostles in the scripture besides the 12. So here's what I'm going to submit to you guys, all right? Because a po- the office of apostle is one that I hear a lot of times has ended. And by the way, we're going to teach right through 1 Corinthians 13 and talk about have the gifts cease, when will they cease, all that kind of stuff. We're going to deal with it when we get there. But I hear this idea about apostles ending all the time, and there were only 12. Here's what I'm going to submit to you. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, it talks about the church being founded on the words and the works of the apostles and the prophets. What I will submit to you is he's talking about the 12 apostles. You see, the earliest sign of apostleship was direct connection with Jesus. So the authors of Scripture, they directly saw and interacted with Jesus. By the way, Paul did as well on the road to Damascus, if you remember. He had a very up-close and personal encounter with Jesus. The test of apostleship in the beginning was their literal interaction of Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit inspired them to give us the Scriptures. What I would submit to you is that the role of the apostle has perhaps changed today in that when you look at the other apostles in Scripture, they were missionaries, evangelists, and church planters. That's who they were, okay? That's what I'm going to submit to you. I do not believe the office of apostleship has ceased. Now, am I telling you, am I telling you now that for, henceforth and forevermore, y'all are not to call me Pastor Richie or to call me Apostle Richie because I planted the church here? Some of you are like, mm, is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. I don't think it takes an apostle to plant a church in Cleveland, Tennessee. I'm, I'm just being honest with y'all, okay? I don't think it takes an apostle to plant a church in Cleveland, Tennessee. 
But if you want to talk about Southeast Asia, all right? If you want to talk about Muslim parts of Africa, if you want to talk about India, where, where, some of the, where some of the Hindus are militarized and extreme and, and kill Christians, okay? If you want to talk about those places, that's where the gift of apostleship, in my opinion, is active today. We had a pastor that came to Calvary Chapel, Chattanooga, several times, Pastor Shadake Johnson. Pastor Shadake was a pastor in northern Africa, and through his ministry, they have established thousands of house churches in communities and tribes and all kinds of places all over Africa that were 100% Muslim. That's what an apostle looks like. That's what I believe, okay? So we talked about the apostles. I just felt like that one needed a little bit of extra explanation Second, prophets. We've already talked about prophets. Again, we will go into 1 Corinthians 14. Again, we're not going to answer every question. 1 Corinthians 14, the entire chapter is about tongues and prophecy. So don't hold me to, we've got to talk about everything with all these gifts today. Third, teachers. We have not defined this one, but it's relatively self-explanatory. Someone in the body with the spiritual gift of teaching, it literally means teaching the things of God to other believers. So in other words, it doesn't mean when I used to teach, when I used to be a biology teacher, it doesn't mean the spiritual gift of teaching was me communicating about photosynthesis to a bunch of ninth graders, okay? It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking God's word and then communicating it to other believers. That is the spiritual gift of teaching. Then miracles. Remember the Greek word was the word we take dynamite from, the dynamite power of God, but we've already spoken about that one. Then gifts of healings, which is one we've already spoken about. Now we got two new ones right here that we have not looked at so far. The next one is the gift of helps. The gift of helps. I think this is pretty fantastic. The one with the gift of helps does anything and everything necessary to help the church as a whole and those in need in the church. They are a literal Swiss army knife within the body of Christ. Okay? The, uh, a person on staff, on our staff, that has what I f- fully believe to be the gift of helps is Andrew Barber. Okay? Andrew is the guy that if you are, I'm, I'm not trying to like burden his plate with what I'm about to say right now. Y'all can't all go take this and just run straight to him. Andrew is the guy that if he finds out somebody in the church is moving, that he will show up at their house unannounced with a truck to move their junk from one place of town to the other. Now y'all tell me, hey y'all tell me now, when do you find out who your real friends are? When you move. Uh Uh-huh. Right? That's when you find out who the real people are, you know, the people who really love you and the people that have the gift of helps, okay? When I think about Project 686 that we talked about today, if you had the gift of helps, I think you'd be a wonderful fit with Project 686. Because you would look at an adoptive or a foster family and you would see them consumed with all the, you know, children and with the the brokenness that comes in a lot of these situations. And you would look at them and you would diagnose them and you would say, you know what that couple right there needs? They need two hours to get out of this house so they can look each other in the eye and have an adult conversation. And so now you have been blessed with the spiritual gift of babysitting. Right? Right? Only because you want to help. Or you look around and you say, man, these folks need some diapers and some wipes or some laundry detergent. Or better yet, give me the clothes. I'll take them to my house. I'll wash them and I'll fold them and I'll bring them back to you. Why? Because you need help. The person with the gift of helps does not care what the job is. They just want to be an assistance to people who are in need. And it geeks them up too. It can be the most like, menial or the the toughest job the dirtiest job and they love it when they see someone else who is helped the next one that we also have not spoken of is the gift of administrations now don't get this one twisted the gift of administrations biblically is not the spiritual gift of excel spreadsheets okay that's not what this is Right? We, we talk about administration as being the most minute details of all kinds of things, you know, uh, finances and things like that within the church. Like, I get that. 
But the spiritual gift of administrations is essentially a leadership gift over a church capacity. The gift of administrations is a giftedness, a grace given by the power of God that is not from a human being, where they're able to look at a group of people in a body like this and then identify what God is doing, what the needs are, this is where we're going, and to bring people with them as they go because people want to follow. Okay, That is what in my view, and the best way that I can explain it, the gift of administrations is. And then last, and I don't intend to say that it is least, you know, but we did have a little bit of that ranking system, perhaps, that Paul gave us in the Scriptures, various kinds of tongues. Now, by definition, we talked about this one a, a few weeks ago, but I'm going to mention it again simply because we're going to spend some time talking about tongues today. The gift of tongues, the literal definition of it, is simply an unknown language. That's it. An unknown language. So that leaves some room for interpretation, right? Because some of y'all are thinking right now, what does that mean? Does that mean it's a human language or an angelic language? Maybe. Yes. No. Right? It doesn't define it. And if I'm being really, really honest with you guys, I want y'all to get way more comfortable in the undefined than we are as a church right now, if I'm just being honest. We're not going to slap definitions on things that the Scripture does not explicitly teach us to. And that's going to be a part of who we are as a church body. So I told you we'd talk about tongues for a few minutes. Well, let's get through one or two more verses, and we'll settle in on it for a second. I tell you what, though, I told you it's going to be an audience participation type of Sunday. We are about to go through a list of questions that were intended to be rhetorical, okay? But we're going to make them not rhetorical. I want y'all to participate, and I want you to answer the questions. Are y'all ready? All right, now y'all tell me right now, are y'all going to do this, or are y'all just going to sit there and stare at me? <laughs> Verse 29. All are not apostles, are they? Yeah, that was your cue, okay? You see how this works? The emphasis on the end communicates the question mark, you know what I'm saying? I just didn't know if y'all caught it, okay? Let's start one more time. All are not apostles, are they? No. All are not prophets, are they? No. All are not teachers, are they? No. All are not, do not work miracles, do they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? Wait a second. This is the point, and I need you guys to understand, we are a church that come from many different theological backgrounds, right? And we are in a town that is very divided because of those theological backgrounds. So that's the point right there where some of you are like, see what you did there. Apostle Richie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about it. We can go through that list, all right? And in just about any church, including charismatic churches, of which we are one, you could go through that list and you could say, are all apostles? And everybody would be like, no, they're not. Are all prophets? Of course not. Those, are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? Surely they don't. Do all have gifts of it? No. Do all have tongues? Wait a second. <laughs> Hold on now. So let's talk about some questions when it comes to tongues. And this may be frustrating to some of y'all. We're going to talk about three different questions. The first one I'm going to be very dogmatic on. The second one I'm going to leave some wiggle room. And the third one's going to be all grace. And I know that drives y'all crazy because we like rules. We say we don't like rules. That's bull. We like rules. I'm just telling you. We do. So questions regarding tongues. Question number one. Our tongues required evidence of salvation. In other words, if you are saved, does that mean you should have the evidenced gift of tongues? Should you speak in tongues if you are saved, right? That's what we're saying. I did not ask that time to be answered. <laughs> You're like, how am I supposed to know? <laughs> Second question. Is it the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? So in other words, the second question is, 
can you be saved, but then later baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the way that you know 100% of the time you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit is because you spoke in tongues, and that is how you know. So our tongues, the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Third question, do all Christians have access or the ability to speak in tongues at some point in their lives? At some point. I'm not saying what point. At some point in their lives. Let's deal with these one at a time. First question, are tongues required evidence of salvation? I submit to you as an article of evidence in the courtroom, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Folks, listen to me, please. Here's the way salvation works. You believe in true faith. Remember, faith is the persuasion of something that is true that elicits a reaction. It's not a simple belief as in, oh yeah, God exists, I'm not going to do anything about it. It's the knowledge that God is who he is and he deserves your life. And so it leads you to make a commitment. But when you have true faith, you are sealed in the Holy Spirit. You are saved. There are no qualifications. There are no additions. There, are, there is no other process. There is nothing else to add to it. 1 John 5 is written. It says this in verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The entire book of 1 John was written so that you may know that you are saved. And I'm going to give you the cliff note version of 1 John right now. How may you know that you are saved according to God's word? Well, do you abide in Jesus? Do you, as a habit of your life, keep God's commands? I'm not talking about perfect, sinless perfection because we'll never get there this side of heaven. As a matter of fact, 1 John says, when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. But as a habit of your life, do you live in righteousness or do you live in darkness? That's what we're talking about. So it talks about abiding in Christ, the habit of your life regarding God's commands and God's laws, and then do you love your brother? Because if you hate your brother and that's the way you live your life, you're not abiding in God. That's what it says. There's nothing else about the Holy Spirit. There's nothing else about uh, tongues. There's nothing else that doesn't talk about baptism. It doesn't talk about any of those things. In faith, sealed in the Holy Spirit, inside of us. And then these are the evidences of our salvation. So the first question for us as a church. By the way, let me ask one more question before we answer this one. Let me ask you all one more question. How many churches do I have the responsibility of pastoring? Can you all tell me? One. I I need you all to understand why I'm asking you that question. I have the responsibility to pastor one church, one group of people, and that's it. And praise God, because you all are a handful. You all know what I'm saying? (laughs) Right? I have the responsibility to pastor one church. Nothing I'm saying today is an accusation, a confrontation, throwing shade at somebody. It's not any of those things. And if y'all receive any of that, you did not get it from me. And you need to chill. Okay? I'm talking about us as a church. Well, number one, do you have to have the, whole, the uh, I'm sorry, the gift of tongues is required evidence of salvation? The answer is absolutely not. And we're going to be dogmatic and we're going to be unified on this one within the church. It would be an addition to Scripture. We ain't doing that, okay? You can be saved without having the gift of tongues. And if you have been told differently, you need to be free from that expectation. And you are free from that expectation in this church. This is what it means to be submitted to God's Word, the authority of God's Word, right? Seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, but under the submission to God's Word. We're not going to embrace teachings that do not align with the Word of God. Second question, are tongues the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Again, this is not an accusation or a finger pointing. This is a a recognition of an, it's just an observation. If you grew up in a classically Pentecostal setting, then you were taught that tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if you have never spoken in tongues, you have not been empowered by the Holy Spirit. So first, where does this teaching come from? Now, let me be very transparent. 
I can't go into great detail here, right? We don't have that kind of time. I've only got another two hours to share with you guys, so we cannot get into the depth of this, all right? The visitors are like, what do you say? <laughs> so what is the, the main foundation of churches and people that would say, yes, tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, very simply, it is Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, I think, Cornelius, the house of Cornelius, and then Acts chapter 19. And in all three of those chapters, essentially what happens is the Holy Spirit falls upon people. The upon is that relationship that we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit falls upon others to overflowing. And in all three of those passages, all the believers, or it seems as if the believers that the Holy Spirit fell upon, they all spoke in tongues. And so the classical Pentecostal position is this is the normative experience of those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, meaning this is the way it always happens without fail. It happens this way. That's what I mean by normative. You all following? Now, I want you all to know there's more to it than that, but that is the main foundation. And you guys go, y'all go read, y'all go study, okay? And you go look it up and do your own homework on our views as well. What about those who would say no? Those who would say no, the gift of tongues is not the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, they would say, number one, there is really no normative salvation or baptism of the Holy Spirit experience. They would say there are plenty of other places in the Scripture where people were saved and where even the Holy Spirit fell upon. For example, Paul was saved in Ephesians, or sorry, Acts chapter 9, if I remember right. The Holy Spirit fell upon him. He did not, as far as is recorded or as far as we can see, speak in tongues, but he did have tongues at a later time in his life. Okay? There are other stories of salvation. We would simply say that there is not a normative experience for salvation or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work the same way every time. Okay, And in fact, I would say that a lot of you guys are under bondage because you expect it is supposed to be normative and your story of salvation or baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't match somebody else's and then you have all kinds of false guilt because you, your, your story doesn't align with others. And I think some of y'all need to be set free from that, to be honest with you, as well. We would also say that if you want to assign a doctrinal teaching to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in other words, what you can expect when the Holy Spirit falls upon somebody, it would come out of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. That's the only thing I see in the Scripture that you would call like a doctrinal statement about what happens when the Holy Spirit falls upon somebody. Power and witness. Okay? And then in addition to that, we would say the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, I'm not trying to use just one or two verses as a pretext. I've already taught y'all that we've got to be careful about that. We all do both sides, myself included, for whatever my doctrinal beliefs are, okay? But I think you see context clues all the way through 1 Corinthians 12 that support this. And then they're summarized in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30. All do not speak with tongues, do they? What we read today. You see, the answer for all of those other gifts was implied to be no. We've read in 1 Corinthians 12 multiple times that God puts the gifts in the body as he desires, that he gives to people individually, okay, which seems to imply that he gives us different gifts in different people for different reasons in different places, as opposed to all the same. It's the same kind of concept with the whole body is not a bunch of ears, are they? Or the whole body's not a bunch of mouths, are they? Otherwise, the body would not work the way the body is supposed to be. I would say there are inferences all through 1 Corinthians 12 that it is not the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, if I have not been clear, okay, I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'll talk about that again in just a moment. But at the chapel, we do not believe that the gift of tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It can be, not necessarily is, right? Last question here for tongues. Are tongues available to all? Are tongues available at some point in time in life to every person? 
we might even be more divided on this one right here. Well, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, let me read it to you really quickly. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. See, I want you to see right now that the basis of 1 Corinthians 12 is that the gifts are used in the assembly, okay? 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about the gifts being used when we assemble together. It means there's a specific context in which it's talking about the gifts. You see it again in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has appointed in the church. And again, he's pointing back to the assembly. But then you also read 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to read you starting in verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Verse 5. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Now let's just sit on that only for a second. Because remember, we're going to get to 1 Corinthians 14. If Paul says, I wish you all spoke to tongues, and he's speaking to a gifted church, what does it mean that a lot of people in the church are not doing? Not, not speaking in tongues. But you know what it could also mean? I wish you all had this gift. Do you see where the gray is in there? Like, if you don't see the gray in that, I'm not 100% sure you're being honest with yourself. What if... And I'm just trying to provoke y'all right now. I'm not trying to make you lean or choose one way or the other. But what if there is a gift of tongues in some of us that is to be used in the assembly? But if you read 1 Corinthians 14, it's very obvious it wouldn't be a lot of us because that would create an extreme amount of disorder. Okay? What if only a few of y'all that have the gift of tongues are ever supposed to even be assigned to use it in the assembly, but then the rest of the people that had tongues, it was always a private gift between them and God? What if? I don't know. I'm not trying to convince you. So, some conclusions about this gift when we talk about the chapel. Again, our one church. We're gonna, I know this is a bad dad joke, but we're going to make a sandwich right now. And some of you are like, I don't need to be told that. I'm already getting hungry. Okay, we don't need to talk about sandwiches right now. Well, we're going to make a little grace sandwich here when we come to our conclusions on tongues as a part of our church. First thing I want to share with you guys is a little saying that was, uh, we mostly attribute to Augustine. I think people have kind of debunked that and said it may belong to somebody before, but we don't exactly know. But I like the content. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Okay? I want y'all to hold on to that when it comes to spiritual gifts. Right? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Here's our second conclusion. We're going to be dogmatic on this one. Tongues are not the evidence of salvation. We're going to be unified on that one within our church body. And we're going to stand on God's word in that regard. Next conclusion. We as a church, I'm talking about as the chapel, we do not believe that tongues to be the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we believe that you can be an empowered, spirit-filled believer and not be operating in the gift of tongues. I don't, I don't know how to say it any more clearly than that. But you see, I also put liberty beside that. You know what that means? That means... That we are in complete good conscience if you are even in this church and disagree with that statement. As long as you do not go to a small group or talk to a brother in our church and then question whether or not they have the Holy Spirit because they do not speak in tongues. That you cannot do. That is not liberty. So we can still play in the same sandbox. We can still be friends. We can still be in the same small group. We can still serve together. But you can't go and be dogmatic in that way with your brother in this church or we're not in good conscience together, okay? Next one. I want to encourage you, every person who feels called to be a part of this church, to desire any and all spiritual gifts. There is no qualification on that statement, okay? 
I have always leaned, I'm just being completely transparent with you guys, I have always leaned that there will be people in the church that never have access to the gift of tongues. But also, I want y'all to know, I am completely open to being wrong. I, I understand. I, I see where it comes from. And I, for one, am open. By the way, you want to talk another level of transparency. I have never operated in the gift of tongues. And so if y'all are dogmatic on the last one, I hadn't even been baptized in the Spirit, so are you in good conscience being in this church under my leadership? I mean, y'all see how this goes, right? I want to encourage all of us to desire any and every spiritual gift that God wants to give. Last one, last part of the sandwich. Folks, when it comes to these topics, we've got to consider our brother and we're not going to be dogmatic in the gray areas, okay? We're not going to force our opinions, our interpretations of these passages upon our brothers and sisters in our church body, okay? And, and more than that, and I think y'all have already heard this from me, I am not empowering y'all to go out and be jerks to other people in other churches either. To go out and use these things as like weapons. That is not the heart of what we're talking about today. So verse 31, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. Earnestly desire. Hmm. Sounds kind of familiar. Well, you may not pick it out yet, but what it means to earnestly desire, a couple of literal translations for the Greek word. It means to burn with zeal, okay? To burn with zeal. Now, can we force ourselves to have an emotional response like that, though? To burn with zeal. Can we force that? What would y'all say? I don't think you can force emotion. But it can also mean, again, a literal definition, to strive after. As a leader in this church, I would tell you that you cannot force yourself to burn with zeal for the spiritual gifts but you can participate in striving after. And I want you to understand, it is an imperative command. It is an instruction in the Scriptures, not just from me as a church leader. In other words, not from a man. It is an authoritative instruction from the Scriptures to pursue and to strive after. Remember Philippians 1, 27, at the end of the verse, uh, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together. Same idea. I asked you in the beginning of this message, do you believe that you are called to this church body? If you are, what I'm telling you is, is that I believe that we all who are called to this church body are actively being called to strive together after the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, I don't know how to say it any more clearly than that. And I want you to know I see some obstacles in our church to our unification over this issue. The first obstacle I see is apathy. I want you to listen to this out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want you to ask yourself hard questions. But realize this, that in the last days, remember the last days according to Hebrews began when Jesus came. We are in those days. Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, and holy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do y'all know what I find interesting about that list right there? Can a man or a woman with those internal characteristics and struggles still hide in a church body? Yes. Like, you look at people that have those characteristics, and it's kind of like, well, they're not killing anybody. Like, they're not sleeping around, breaking up relationships. They seem to be more like internal things. You can still hide in a church body with a lot of those characteristics. You can show up hoping to absolve yourself of guilt or be seen in a certain way. The religious practice in a negative way. I don't want to always use that. As a negative, the dead religion, 
Verse 5, holding to a form of godliness, though they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. The first obstacle that I see in our church body to our unification in pursuing the power of the Holy Spirit is that we have apathy in our midst. And listen, again, you got to hear my heart when I say this, okay? That I am not sitting in judgment even when I say something like that. Like in our culture today, if you ever say anything negative about anybody, you're all of a sudden a hater. That's, that's just not right. My heart slides into apathy all the time. Are you going to tell me you are never threatened with apathy in your spiritual life? Well, you're lying. The human condition is to slide towards apathy, and we have to be corrected all the time. And right now, apathy is holding many of us back from pursuing this relationship with the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it needs to be repented of. If you're apathetic towards these things, if you have not heard the calls from God's Word and from our church body to pursue, if there is no desire in you whatsoever to do that, you need to question about whether that apathy exists in your own heart. And if it does, you need to repent. I would also say that the other biggest obstacle that I see besides apathy is fear. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Now, timidity, let's just say this, that is a very PC translation of that word. What timidity means is a spirit of fear that is not of God. To use another word that is a literal translation of timidity is cowardice. Cowardice. All right, now let me make this real practical. For us as a church body, fear is one of the biggest things that is holding us back from pursuing graces of God. And that's what spiritual gifts and that's what the Holy Spirit is. And the way this fear is being manifested in us is this. Well, it's going to get out of control because we don't trust that it's going to be worked under the submission of God's Word. Well, in my last church, it did this. Well, other people have used it against me like that. They've judged me because I don't have this gift. People are going to think I'm weird because I do have this gift. And all of these things that are essentially judgments of everybody around us and fears of what everybody is going to do and that somehow God is not going to be glorified in these things These are all fears. Many of you are afraid of these things, perhaps even because of your past experiences. But I need you guys to understand that is cowardice. That's what it is. If you sit in this church and you say, I'm okay with the way it is. I don't want to rock the boat. I'm fine just like this. That is cowardice. And I want you to understand, a spirit of fear that it is not of God, cowardice, cowardice needs to be repented of. If apathy is holding you back, repent. If cowardice is holding you back, repent. But some of you, you simply need to know who God is a little bit more. I want to remind you of Luke 11. Most of this passage we've already read, I think, twice. But some of you need to hear it a third and a fourth and a fifth time. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers, he says, Don't bother me. The door's already been shut. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. The model, the New Testament model for seeking is often through prayer as well as other means. 
And the New Testament idea of prayer is to be persistent when we seek. It's not the idea that if you pray once in sincerity that God should answer at that point and your responsibility is done. Your responsibility is to persevere in your prayers. And the point is not that God is the neighbor inside his house saying, go away, I'm already in bed with my kids. I ain't getting up to give you anything. That's not the point. The point is your responsibility is to persist and then, verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be, door open, or it will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Now, suppose one of you has, or your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Listen, some of you guys have not sought because you don't understand that God loves you. God is not the reluctant man in the house. He is the loving Father. If the reluctant man will get up at night and give somebody some bread, how much more so will your heavenly Father who loves you, who himself died on a tree for the sake of your sins when you were dead in your sins, not because you deserved it, how much more so does he desire to give you good gifts? Infinitely more so. And what is the Holy Spirit? He is not to be afraid of. He is God. Why would we not desire more of God for any reason imaginable? He loves you. He wants to give himself to you. He wants to bestow graces upon you. It is my belief that these are our obstacles in our church. Their apathy, their fear, and their lack of understanding of God's love. And if you find yourself not pursuing, not being fervent, not desiring, not coming after the exhortations that were given in the Scripture, then I want you to examine yourself before God. And I want Him to be the one to, if He needs to bring conviction or restoration or a renewal of your faith or an understanding of the love of God. But frankly, I would just tell you to, I would just tell you to obey and to let God meet you in your obedience. So I'm going to remind you of the phrase one more time. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. And I'm going to remind you that I believe that this is who we are and this is where we're going right now in this season as a church body. And I'm going to ask you, do you feel called to this? Because I definitely believe that at the chapel, God has called us to be His bold witnesses acting in love and unity, submitting to the authority of His Word, walking in the power of His Spirit. And we've already prayed today, and we're not going to take the time to direct you to pray for the same thing. We have been praying for the filling of the Holy Spirit for weeks in this church body. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to ask you, If you want to pray to be filled, I just want you to come during this last song. We're going to have some people that are going to be up front. We're going to be ready. We're going to lay hands on you, and we're simply going to pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing to be afraid of to ask that. And you say, I have asked that. Well, like I told you, Dwight Moody, they asked him, why do you keep telling people to be filled? You tell us all the time, be filled, be filled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Stop telling us to be filled. You're repeating yourself. Why are you repeating yourself? He said, because I leak. Because I need to be refilled. So if you don't feel like you've ever been filled with the Holy Spirit, come on. If you've never confessed Jesus before, you need to come up here and you need to tell us that. Okay? But I want to invite you to come. And we're going to have people up front during this song. And I want you to break all this pretense that we can't move around in this place. And that we've got to stay anchored in our seats. And I want you to come even if you're fearful, and I want you to come even if you're apathetic. And this is just life in the body. We're going to lay hands on each other, and we're going to pray while all of us worship. So if i got some prayer leaders, y'all come on up front. You guys stand.
we're going to worship together. This altar is open starting right now.